Welcome back. This is the Aesthetics Lecture Series. I'm D.R. Merrill. Last time we finished up with Aristotle and then we went into the uh, Roman, the, the lone Roman thinker here, uh, Plotinus, um, which is in a sense a rehash but a new way to explore Platonism. This is the Neoplatonic uh, school that is initiated there. And so we left off there. This lecture, I don't think I have quite as much on St. Augustine. Um, so I think we'll do Aquinas and Augustine together, the medieval thinkers. So with the collapse of Rome, um, which was a fallen pagan state, and later, of course, became uh, the first Christian state, um, you had Constantinople, Justinian, and then we move into uh, the doctrines based on the writings of the apostles and uh, the hearsay of Christ. Christ is the Savior. And um, actually, uh, uh, St. Uh, Paul, or Saul, uh, you know, is his translated name, Saul of Tarsus, actually went around a lot of these uh, Mediterranean islands when he was trying to preach the doctrine of Christ. Um, he actually was not that far from where uh, Socrates actually gave his apology speech before he was sentenced to death. And he also went to Ephesus. And you can read these, of course, um, in the New Testament, or, or about this in the New Testament. Now, uh, you can also kind of see where Plato's ideas translate analogously very well to the to the new Christian doctrine, and and uh, Saint Paul was very aware of this. Saint Paul was a more of an intellectual kind of mind. He was definitely more of what I would call an introverted, intuitive type, and as was Christ. And so he was able to kind of present us with this frame. Joseph Ratzinger's book, The Introduction to Christianity, it's a great, it has a great chapter um, about this, about the philosophers, as, um, as does historian Arthur Herman in his great work, Plato versus Aristotle and the Struggle for Western Civilization. So now we, we can see where the ultimate idea of the good, which is explored in Plato's Republic, um, is kind of easy to, to conceptualize as the Christian God the ultimate good, the source of good and all of value. And then it is this good that, um, of course, when we're taking in account the Old Testament and all of the Hebrew scriptures uh, with the early prof earlier prophets, Abraham, Moses, you, and Noah, sorry, you can... Um, see how he thought he, he could adapt that almost archetypal God, but put him into, in a sense, an even more perfect and delimited kind of conception of God, where um, Christ is, of course, God incarnate. Um, you have to believe this to be a Christian. He's the, he was immaculately conceived, and also he was resurrected from the dead. And all of these dogmas have to be espoused by the Christians, um, even today. Um, especially in the Orthodox, or, or like Roman Catholicism. And... We, we, we move into, with Christ now as a bridge to save us, we no longer have to have the animal sacrifices. We're able to have everlasting life. 
No other blood has to be spilled. And this takes care of everything once and for all, for all those that follow Christ. So, St. Augustine of Hippo is very influenced by Christianity, not right away. He's converted. Uh, his mother was a major influence, as was his fallings with uh, Manichaeism, or the followers of Mani. And um, and then his um, studies of Neoplatonism. So Plato, through mostly Plotinus, he figures out a way to synthesize Christianity with philosophy. And his big idea is reason still is important, but it kind of plateaus. Faith has to kind of reposition and send you on a higher trajectory to everlasting life and the ultimate good, which is God. So, you know, it, it's by, you know, I believe in order that I may understand. That's essentially the uh, Platonic Christian kind of synthesis here. Okay, that that's St. Augustine. We're going to go over him. And then, of course... The Dominican Augustinian, St. Thomas Aquinas. There, there are other Aristotelians that are influential in the reign of the church. Peter Abelard, um, Boethius to an extent. Um, and then, of course, St. Thomas's teacher, St. Albert the Great. Um, so we're going to see how he synthesizes basically Augustinianism with Aristotelianism. So Christianity, which is very Platonic, with a, an Aristotelian synthesis and kind of like the natural uh, philosophy of Aristotle. And it is really because of St. Thomas we leave the medieval period and then the resurgence or renaissance uh, pops up and, and we're able to move into the modern period, the Enlightenment, the Age of Unreason. <clears throat> so, going back to St. Augustine, um, Augustine, w when we're talking about his aesthetics, um, was mainly focused on music. So, for Augustine, the influence of Christianity, you know, music is the art form where you're sitting in the pew, and this brings his spirit soaring closest you know, to the heavenly forms uh, through song. Um, and uh, let's see. So he's really this kind of, he, he's an extroverted valuer. Um, so he, he has that kind of platonic psychology and he's able to override some of Plato's prejudices against poetry or poetic m madness. And, and, and he sees, because he sees reason as really a limited but necessary um, portion of faculty. So Augustine brings into his aesthetical doctrine a heavy uh, metaphysical understanding of God in relation to creation and, you know, um, imitation and mimesis kind of fades here a little bit. Um, but art is a means of justice through faith. And there are several conflicts that Augustine proposes and answers, and this includes pagan versus Christian, nature versus art, imitation versus symbol, and creation versus begetting. Okay, um, so Augustine believes music is more divine than painting or, or visual things, sculptures and whatnot. Um, other iconography or what we call iconography of the Christian church of the Catholic Church 
And this is because visual beauty references things of our perceived nature, which is limited to a sensible experience, experience, and it's devoid of God's perfection of good and beauty. However, although the music, you know, it can bring some divine harmony to the soul, nothing is as important as the harmonious power intellectually of Scripture. Augustine's philosophy is platonic for that reason. He, he, he does agree with Plato to an extent that art can, poetic, fine art, um, can kind of mislead the self on that quest for truth. And for Augustine, the scripture and God are both truth. Uh, scriptures, the, the means to the end, which is God. <clears throat> And therefore, this is the only path to ensure that it is followed. So, as long as art is used for the holy mission of the church and used against the visual references and advocacy of paganism, visual art is in good standing. The metaphysical fulfillment of art is beauty. Augustine's theory, followed through the Middle Ages, is about beauty more than a philosophy of art. Of course, we're still not to that point where we have a fine art philosophy yet. So it's, you know, this tradition is seen in the philosophy of St. Thomas, but again, it, it still isn't precise, but it points us to the direction which uh, fine art later becomes. Both of these medieval thinkers are concerned with beauty, and, and, it's, and it's that, like we discussed in the first lecture, it's that innate beauty that emanates from within outward. It's true beauty that relates to truth, goodness, wholeness. That beauty. And then, although for Augustine, you know, aesthetics is also about measure, like it was for Plato and Aristotle, it deals more with divine fulfillment or spiritual harmony or, or feeling than with that kind of like obsession with geometry and, and what's mathematical and, and purely intellectual abstractions. So the measure can be found in different forms, in proportion, organization of rhythm, uh, connections, which spiritual and empirical, and divine measurement. So Neoplatonism continues after Augustine and even Aquinas in forms such as uh, Italian humanism, which you, you can find in Ficino, or in the Cambridge Platonists, uh, such as Shaftesbury. Platonism has also had a handle on aestheticians and artists in particular, despite Plato's explicit banishment of poets, but it is the idealistic temperament artists are always trying to discover true beauty in their endeavors. All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and end with St. Saint, uh, Saint Augustine. And we're going to move now into St. Thomas, um, which is can be seen up here in my image. Oop, I guess it's wrapped around the cord. So we have St. Thomas in the center. And then you have Plato on the right, Aristotle on the left, Christ up above, and he's this culmination. He's the great synthesizer of everything scholastic up to that point. Because remember, in this time, the intellectuals were the monks. They were the ones that could actually read the illuminated manuscripts and transcribe them and, and, and keep them from being eroded and, and lost. So... Augustine thought that he, there, there is one quote that's attributed to him actually on my clock up there of him. Beware the man of only one book. It, it, there's plenty of things to learn even from the negative because he does hold all of the Christian dogmas. And a lot of people did not think a union with Aristotle could be done that if in a truly non-Platonic strictly puritanically Aristotelian influence, there would be no room for a creator God. Um, it's all about evolution, um, individual particulars, 
and uh, kind of a selfishness. So, but but he does find a way to, to deal with that, and he's not just a, a, a spouter of, oh, I just hold this position because it's Aristotelian. Many times he disagrees with, with Aristotle, but he gives good reason, and he never contradicts the dogmas of the Catholic Church. So, for Aquinas, now going into his aesthetics, which are some great books, um, there's two books in particular by Umberto Eco, who wrote The Name of the Rose, great fiction work, um, Art or Aesthetics of the Middle Ages, and The Aesthetics of St. Thomas Aquinas. Excellent, excellent, excellent read. Can't recommend it highly enough. Also, um, you can find interesting information about St. Thomas's kind of ideas and how, I guess, how they relate in, um, oh shoot, um, in the Neo-Thomist work, Art and Scholasticism, and it is better to get, by, by Jacques Maritain, the Neo-Thomist, it is better to get a publication of it with the essay Frontiers of Poetry, and while I really like his uh, work, um, The Responsibility of the Artist, which kind of deals with that union, but difference between ethics and, and um, aesthetics. But, I mean, it's, it's really a great read. Um, I still would recommend his uh, lectures that were entitled um, Creative Intuition, um, through um, art and poetry, I think. These are all really great works, um, if you're interested in these kind of ideas. We will probably still go over Maritain. Um, there's a couple other neo Thomas that had some interesting things to say. But um, without further ado, St. Thomas, Art um, as Causation in Nature, uh, Generationum, or art as imitation, which leads to art as objects of enjoyment, the, the fine arts. Of course, he didn't really have a specific name or exact idea or venue for this, even not, not even necessarily the exact materials, um, but we, we kind of are getting an idea here now of something that can be contemplated on. And, of course, we're looking at mostly through a religious lens, a kind of meditative um, contemplation. But um, because the ancients did not have this idea, it, it was festered really by Kant. So before we get to Kant, though, one of the only two thinkers in Western thought, according to Mortimer J. Adler, with any sort of originality and in, in the comprehensiveness of the ideas on this subject with the materialization, the actuality out of the potential as a fine art per se would be St. Thomas. And this is because he brings us away from art kind of just as a science, which is the opinion of Francis Bacon and John Milton. Bacon said, quote, empire over creation is founded on the arts and science alone, unquote, not to be divorced from one another. The medieval filtering of beauty and the philosophy of aesthetics was in short supply. Aquinas developed three properties, beauty, clarity, integrity. In the system of of St. Thomas, the, he was a Dominican monk. He was a theologian by training. And he did subscribe to the Aristotelian influence. Uh, there are still Neoplatonic elements found in him. Like I said, he's the great synthesizer. The ideal forms of Plato, they can be found in the metaphysical transcendentals of his uh, Summa Theologiae. One wholeness and being, true, correlating to integrity, good, which is ideal, 
ethical art in accordance with the best possible reality, beauty, the summation and evidence of transcendentals one through three. So all of the marching, this is the evidence. Nothing exists, he says, which does not participate in beauty or goodness, since each thing is a beautiful and good according to its proper form. Created beauty is nothing other than a likeness of the divine beauty participated in things, unquote. So here we have that kind of Platonic and Christian and Augustinian idea of what really exists and is acting in accordance with nature is pure and it comes from God. Quote, the beautiful is the same as the good, and they differ in aspect only. The notion of the good is that which calms the desire, while the notion of the beautiful is that which calms the desire by being seen or known, unquote. So, addressing here now what we consider truly aesthetical um, questions and concerns, how does beauty fit into this that it partly answers the question and then um you might wonder well what's what's the connection between sort of epistemological concerns and beauty he gives us a quote here quote beauty adds to goodness a relation to the cognitive faculty so that good means that which simply pleases the appetite appetite being a psychological term in aristotle and plato while the beautiful is something pleasant to apprehend, unquote. So we're still talking about beautiful things, but beauty is a much deeper concept than it is in a contemporary sense. The most famous quotation of Aquinas' commentaries on beauty reads in Latin, quote, id quod visum placet, unquote. And I might have butchered that. I, I don't know Latin very well. It means that which pleases upon being seen. And this statement alone has had a great impact um, and through, through, the, through the consequences of it being espoused up through the Renaissance. It's quoted in um, James Joyce's The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And, and some of those kind of aesthetical ideas are um, tossed around and and um, explored i think the i think the character kind of abandons it but still the the pleasures and the desires are aimed at the good that's the transcendentals and they're not meant for any sort of divorce from one another quote beauty consists in due proportion for the senses delight in things duly proportioned because the sense, too, is a sort of reason, as is every cognitive power, unquote. So now he's starting to kind of answer some of these epistemological correlations to beauty. And it's something that it has that direct sense experience kind of... Um, way that we're kind of pointing towards a, a judgment of taste or, or just a judgment of pleasure. <clears throat> so he does differ in the Platonic, uh, Plotinus and Augustinian kinds of views of beyond sense experience. Quote, in some agents, the form of the thing made preexists according to its natural being as in those that act by their nature, as a man generates a man, or a fire generates a fire, whereas in other agents, the form of the thing to be made pre-exists according to the intelligible being in those that act the intellect, and thus the likeness of a house pre-exists in the mind of the builder, and this may be called the idea of the house, since the builder intends to build his house like to the form conceived in his mind, unquote. You do see how he's a strong epistemologist like 
Aristotle, but actually superior. He, he, he just understands it thoroughly. Quote, phantasm, and that's I, uh, imagination, think fantastic. Apart from memory is, quote, a kind of storehouse of forms received by sense, unquote, which, quote, does not combine or divide, unquote. So art is still an activity by the most perfectly known organism, that's man, and art is a synthesis to create in honor of the all creator for teleological reasons, i.e. purposes for and in. So this does not compete against divine creation in a literal sense, but then it's not art, um, you know, not out of nothing or ex nihilo. But it's the reshaping of matter. It's a purely human activity and is such a form that must be ontologically dependent because it has no autonomy. It's an end in itself. So now we're starting to see the more, you know, peak of rays into where the modern mind took this. Quote, every craftsman intended to give his work the best possible constitution not indeed absolutely speaking, but in relation to its purpose, unquote. For Aquinas, the didactic form's beauty for pleasure is incidental. The goal, unobtainable for perfection, aimed towards the good. And with that, we'll go ahead and stop. We'll break way for, I, I guess, I, some of the Enlightenment thinkers we'll discuss next don't really discuss a lot about aesthetics in particular. It's not a central issue, but we might kind of sum some of them up um, before we get to Ficino and can't. So thank you very much.